the annual Tisch Lecture. Uh, this uh, lecture is sponsored by our uh, trustee, Lori Tisch, who had a great interest in, in bringing uh, public issues into view with um, leading people in the United States and around the world uh, to inform our community and to uh, spark debate and to help us think about uh, directions we are going as an educational institution. Um, we've had um, speakers here who've addressed various aspects of education, generally looking broadly at, at the development of um, this work uh, in our society and other societies around the world. Um, I'm very happy today that we have with us um, a distinguished world leader um, who's going to um, shed light on relationship between education and international development. Um, I'd like to say a few words about Helen Clark. She became administrator of the United Nations Development Program in April 2009. I'm just going to give you some highlights from her biography, just so you have a sense of um, uh, what, what the context is for her, her presence here. Um, she's the first um, woman to lead that organization within the United Nations and is one of the top officials in the UN and indeed in their work around the world. Um, she's also the, the chair of the United Nations Development Group, which is a committee that's formed of all of the heads of the various funds within the UN. So you can imagine that she's overseeing a, a vast worldwide array of, of, of development projects and, and across, across countries. Before um, her appointment to the UNDP, Helen Clark served for nine years as Prime Minister of New Zealand. She served successive terms from two, one, 1999 to 2008. I'm just going to say a few things. There's, there's a great deal that we could say about those, those years and, and New Zealand society, and, but I want to just give you a couple of highlights, um, particularly in relation to our interests in education. Uh, we, we do know that New Zealand achieved um, very significant economic growth over those years um, and also high levels of investment in education and, and also, in parallel, investments in health. Um, she's a prime minister who showed a tremendous sense of um, the responsibility of society to address the well-being of families and also older citizens. In an er earlier panel and other work today, we've been talking about culturally responsive teaching and the relation of um, different social groups in society. So it's very notable that um, under her leadership, her government prioritized reconciliation and settlement of historic grievances with uh, New Zealand's indigenous people and created a clear policy for the development of an inclusive multiracial, racial, and multi-faith society. So I think she brings uh, to us a you know, tremendous uh, background in that respect. As Prime Minister, Helen Clark was a member of the Council of Women World Leaders, which is an international network of current and former women presidents and prime ministers. And their mission is to mobilize the highest level women leaders globally to collective action on issues that are of critical importance from their perspective. I'm just going to say a little bit more about her political career, which is, um, you know, many um, assignments and, and elections won and, and ministerial posts um, and so forth. Um, but she's had very extensive uh, parliamentary and a ministerial career. Great, great experience in that respect. Ten terms as a representative uh, from her area in Auckland, which is a multicultural um, uh, district um, in the electorate. And she chaired the, uh, the Parliament's uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, so quite a lot of experience worldwide with that. Um, she um, also has in her record um, great leadership in building the agenda of sustainability and, and the management of resources for, um, you know, for, for New Zealand. Um, I just want to say a couple more things that um, she's uh, taught um, in uh, political science, political studies department at the University of Auckland, which is their alma mater. So we have uh, faculty careers and academic interests in, in common. Um, and, and with that, I would like to introduce Helen Clark. Thank you very much.
thank you very much to the Provost of the uh, College. Can I acknowledge uh, Susan Foreman, the, the President of the Teachers College of Columbia, and from the University of Waikato, the Right Honourable Jim Bolger, Chancellor of the University, and Mrs Joan Bolger, uh, Roy Crawford, Vice-Chancellor, Alistair Jones, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, and Roger Maltzen, the Dean of Education. And thank you to the Teachers College for inviting me to give this Tish Distinguished Lecture today, and also to be part of the Day of Events, which uh, celebrates the relationship between the Teachers College of Columbia University and the University of Waikato, New Zealand. I should say that while I myself spent my student life and academic career at Auckland University, I did grow up in the Waikato region of New Zealand, just 20 miles from the university, and I visited the university on a great many occasions in my public life career. And even since, uh, only last year I was at the University of Waikato in Hamilton for a very large uh, day's gathering of women in tertiary education. And they asked me to come and speak about the work I do now as administrator of the United Nations Development Programme. So I do welcome the partnership which Waikato University has developed with Teachers College uh, Columbia and I'm sure it will work for the benefit of the staff and the students of each institution. Well, the topic I've given myself today is a very broad one, education and international development. So I think I should start with two disclaimers. The first is, it is 31 years since I was last employed as a university teacher, a profession I very much enjoyed, I might say, but it is rather a long time ago that I was a professional educator. Second disclaimer is that UNDP is not a specialist organisation in the field of education, but of course progress in education is fundamental to achieving progress in all the areas in which we work. Having made both disclaimers, let me say that I myself am passionate about the power of education to transform individual lives and prospects and those of families, communities and nations. And I personally count myself extremely fortunate to have been a member of New Zealand's post-war baby boomer generation where educational opportunities were wide open to me. I am highly motivated to see children and young people everywhere enjoy those same opportunities to acquire knowledge and skills and reach their full potential. In our world, knowledge is power and education empowers. It is an indispensable part of the development equation. It has intrinsic value, which extends far beyond its economic value. Intrinsic value in empowering people to determine their own destiny and choice, have choice over their lives. And that is why the opportunity to be educated is so central to human development. Let me say a little bit about the human development paradigm within which UNDP works. As for more than two, year, two decades, our organisation has been guided by the pioneering work of Pakistani economist Mahbub ul Haq and Indian Nobel laureate Amartya Sen on the human development paradigm. Both men saw development as being about far more than growth in GDP per capita. The concept of human development is about increasing the ability of people to live longer, healthier lives, to be educated, and to live in dignity. And it encompasses the enlargement of people's freedoms and choices. When the very first human development report was published by UNDP in 1990, it began by stating that, quote, people are the real wealth of a nation. From those words, it set out the case for a new approach to thinking about development, which put people at its very center. That approach laid the foundation for ideas and concepts which now form part of the mainstream development discourse, but was considered rather radical at the time. How radical to put people at the center of development. A new index was established in an endeavor to gauge progress 
on this broader measure of development. It was the Human Development Index, and from the outset, it included indicators for education status and health, as well as for GDP per capita. Income is not irrelevant, but it's not everything either. The Human Development Report Office in the United Nations Development Program and the global community of collaborators it works with have also been rather innovative in measuring development progress beyond the Human Development Index itself. So two years ago, when we did a 20-year anniversary Global Human Development Report, we added three new indices, the Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index, the Gender Inequality Index, and the Multidimensional Poverty Index, all trying to gain a more nuanced understanding of the inequities which persist and of the multiple deprivations which the poor in our world experience. In each of these indices, education is a critical component because of the seminal role of knowledge in expanding opportunities and capabilities. And it's that which makes education so central to human development. Now, education also figures prominently in the pantheon of human rights, which the United Nations and member states over time have established. And to go straight to Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, proclaimed by the General Assembly in 1948, it states that everyone has the right to education. Education shall be free, at least in elementary and fundamental stages. Elementary education shall be compulsory. Technical and professional education shall be made generally available, and higher education shall be equally accessible to all on the basis of merit. Secondly, education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. It shall promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations racial or religious groups, and shall further the activities of the United Nations for the maintenance of peace. And thirdly, parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education which will be given to their children. The emphasis in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on education is very much on this concept of education as a right, and on its broader role in advancing humankind. Investing in education is investing in human potential, which is why it has multiple benefits for development. Indeed, investing in education creates a virtuous cycle of development. For example, by helping to reduce poverty, UNESCO estimates that for every extra year of schooling a person has, that is associated with increased earnings of up to 10%. In reducing child mortality, a child born to a mother who can read is 50% more likely to live beyond the age of five. In improving maternal health, as girls who are able to stay longer in school are also likely to be able to delay the age of marriage and childbirth. The United Nations Population Fund estimates that adolescent girls are up to five times more likely to die from complications of pregnancy than a woman in their 20s. And it can also help turn the tide on HIV AIDS. Women with post-primary education, for example, are five times more likely to be knowledgeable about HIV AIDS and its transmission than are illiterate women. So for all these reasons and many more, education features prominently in the Millennium Development Goals established following the Millennium Summit of the United Nations in 2000, which I was privileged to attend as New Zealand Prime Minister. MDG2 aims, quote, to ensure that by 2015, children everywhere, boys and girls alike, will be able to complete a full course of primary schooling. But achieving that MDG is linked to making progress on the others. For example, on reducing hunger, which both keeps children out of school 
and prevents them from concentrating and learning effectively when they are there. On fighting HIV AIDS, children in HIV affected households are less likely to be in school, more likely to drop out after they have enrolled and more likely to be involved in child labour. In improving access to energy and water, girls' education suffers where there is a burden on them of having to walk long distances to collect wood and or water for the family. Also, making progress on the education MDG is linked to achieving gender equality because where women and girls are not treated equally, their education does not get priority. We also have MDG 3 specifically targeting gender equity in primary and secondary education with the aim of achieving it there by 2005, not met, I regret to say, and in all levels of education no later than 2015. So, how much progress is being made on achieving these education MDG targets? On average, by 2010, people around the world had close to two years more education than they had in 1990, which is the base year against which we measure the MDG progress. Enrolment in primary education stood at 89% in developing countries in 2009, up from 82% a decade before. The greatest progress was achieved in sub-Saharan Africa, where enrolment increased by 18 percentage points between 1999 and 2009 to 76%. Some examples of fast progress. Ethiopia is a least developed country. It reduced the number of its children not in school from 6.5 million in 1999 to 2.7 million within the decade. Benin in West Africa had one of the world's lowest net enrolment ratios in 1999. Now, achieving universal primary education is within its grasp. As for the gender gap in school enrolment, well, in developing countries, that had narrowed by 2009 to 96 girls for every 100 boys in primary and secondary education. We're not quite there yet, but quite a lot of progress has been made. But obviously, there's still a lot of work to do to reach these basic benchmarks. In 2009, 67 million children remained out of school. The rate of progress towards universal primary education had slowed, with no noticeable increase in enrolment between 2008 and 2009 in any region other than South Asia. That obviously dims prospects for reaching the MDG target of universal primary education by 2015, a target which should have been achievable with accelerated action. If schooling is to reach those children living at the end of the road and beyond the end of the road, much greater efforts are needed. So uh, there have been a lot of obstacles. The global recession, high food prices of recent years, to name just two areas of problems, erected further barriers to achieving these education-related MDGs. With falling real and or disposable incomes, families can be forced to cut back on education costs and even take their children out of school altogether. And a second chance doesn't always or even often come around for such children. So it's important to note the role of social protection systems in improving school attendance. As basic social protection can not only help put food on the table, but it can also help keep children in school. And UNDP is a very strong advocate for social protection systems because we see them locking in development gains like levels of school attendance and better nutrition. So the cash transfer programs, which boost family incomes, definitely do take pressure off families which have needed their children to work to supplement household income or to take care of the younger siblings while the parents work. And there's a wide range of these programs operating around the world, 
Some of them are conditional, some of them are not. The conditional programs generally provide income supplements to families in return for evidence of children's enrolment in school and their having had basic health checks and or immunizations. In my personal view, there is a debate to be had about whether the schemes with conditions actually produce better results than those without, and whether schemes with conditions may have the perverse effects of compounding family poverty and inequities where the conditions for receiving the cash transfer simply cannot be met for a range of reasons. But in fairness, I must note that conditional cash transfers have been linked to substantial decreases in child labour in countries as wide ranging as uh, Brazil to Cambodia and to noticeable increases in school attendance in a number of countries. In Cambodia, two pilot cash transfer programs documented a reduction in school dropout rates by 20 to 30 percentage points for students between 6th and 7th grades. And in Pakistan, such a program increased the number of 10 to 14-year-old girls in school by 11 percentage points. Evidence of improvements in learning outcomes as a result, however, are not as strong, suggesting that more needs to be done to improve the quality of the education being provided. A study unrelated to uh, cash transfers of 21 countries in sub-Saharan Africa showed that 22 to 24 year olds with five years of education had a 40% chance of being illiterate. It does not say much for the quality of the education uh, they were able to get. So I think we're talking about twin goals here. One is to lift access to education for every child. The other is to improve the quality of the education to ensure that children attain at least basic literacy and numeracy skills. So how do we overcome some of these barriers to access? Well, there are deep-rooted inequalities preventing children from attending schools. They may be related to gender, wealth, ethnicity, language group, disability, geographical location. Household data from 42 countries suggests that rural children are twice as likely to be out of school as children in urban areas are. But even in urban areas, we see the disparities. UNICEF, the UN's children's agency, estimates that while in Delhi, around 90% of children attend primary school, of the children living in the informal settlements, only around 55% do. So we need to be targeting those disparities and eliminating them if we are to guarantee children their right to education and to break into generational cycles of vulnerability and disadvantage. The Human Development Report, which UNDP produced two years ago for Latin America and the Caribbean, made the point that for higher income developing countries, the evidence strongly suggests that intergenerational educational mobility has been one of the most important factors in determining socioeconomic mobility between generations. And they cite in particular a study from Chile which finds that the decline in inequality between 1990 and 2006 can be largely explained by the ma major expansion of tertiary education over the same period. Back to the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights, which appropriately, in my view, emphasised the importance of, quote, free education, at least in the elementary and fundamental stages. School fees and related costs for uniforms, books and other equipment, of course, can also pose significant barriers to access for children from poor families. Not a surprise then that when countries like Ghana, Malawi, Nepal, Tanzania abolished primary school fees, all experienced surges in school enrolment. And a study in Kenya found that distributing three school uniforms decreased absenteeism from class by 43%. In 
It's also true that children who are hungry find it hard to learn and are less likely to be at school. And that makes it important to link access to education and is also linked to poor cognitive development. And undernourished children are more likely to score poorly in tests at school, start school later and drop out earlier. The World Food Programme estimates that 66 million children currently enrolled in primary school in developing countries are undernourished and that on current trends that number would increase to 82 million by 2015. Then a much larger number, approximately 195 million children under the age of five now, are chronically malnourished even before beginning school, placing them on a trajectory for poor academic achievement in the future. So this, to me, reinforces the importance of linking initiatives which boost participation in education with those which tackle poverty, hunger, poor nutrition, and improve health status. In this respect, school feeding programs are successful in boosting attendance, especially among girls, and are successful in improving nutrition. And in times of crisis, programs like that are critical for children who live in poverty. World Food Programme and World Bank report that in response to the high world food prices in 2008, 20 developing countries scaled up their school feeding programs to help keep children in school. Last year, during the very severe drought reported in northern Kenya, UNICEF reports that many schools remained open right through the holidays in the drought-affected areas so that the children could still access the feeding programs. And similarly, in Somalia, a very poor country, 155 schools uh, reaching 37,000 internally displaced children were supported by UNICEF to remain open through the school breaks so the children could be fed. These sort of programs can also have a positive spillover effect uh, for the local community. And World Food Programme has a homegrown school feeding initiative which works to link the school feeding programs with the local small-scale farmer production. WFP says their initiative, quote, is based on the premise that low farm productivity, poor agricultural market development, and poor educational and nutritional outcomes are mutually reinforcing and jointly determine key aspects of rural hunger and poverty. So they are taking an integrated approach to that range of issues and how to deal with them. Obviously, there's a whole range of other health and disability issues beyond hunger and nutrition, which are impacting on children's access to education and their ability to learn. And I mentioned just uh, one of many of them because it's uh, been well documented, and that is worm infections. Children who suffer from them are less likely to be regularly at school, and they're more likely to experience serious illness. So it's appropriate that school-based deworming programs have been established in many countries, and they do have a beneficial impact on children coming to school. Uh, one study from Western Kenya uh, absolutely confirmed that deworming had lifted attendance, and that when the younger children were able to have that treatment, they attended school on average for 15 more days a year. Let me make a brief comment on education preparing young people to participate in the economy and society. As recent uprisings in quite a number of the Arab states have brought to the fore the concerns of youth about exclusion, exclusion from the workplace, exclusion from input into decision making, uh, and denial of their basic rights. When we look at the high unemployment rates being experienced in a number of these states, we see they have been exacerbated by a mismatch between the knowledge and skills young people have acquired in rather outdated education systems and the needs of the workplace. You, the 2010 Human Development Report for Egypt documented a rather striking trend in unemployment rates for youth there, reporting that 
youth unemployment rates actually increase with the level of education. Now, it sounds the wrong way around, doesn't it? But among youth with only secondary education, 15% were unemployed in 2008 in Egypt. Those who had university or other higher education had an unemployment rate of 26%. The Arab Knowledge Report, which has just been launched jointly by UNDP and a foundation in the Gulf, highlights the urgent need for education system reform in the region within the context of the broader political, economic and social reforms which are taking place. But it's not only this region of the Arab states which is experiencing a jobs and employment crisis. The truth is that our world needs hundreds of millions more decent jobs and livelihoods to overcome existing unemployment, place new entrants in the workforce, and address the needs of the many working poor who live in households where family members live on less than $2 a day each. And that latter category of the people living on under $2 a day each uh, those families uh, have uh, between them around 900 million workers, which is approximately 30% of the global workforce. That's why I say, if you take all these things together, we have a jobs and livelihoods crisis on our hands. So unless country by country, there is a much greater focus on inclusive and equitable economic growth, expectations raised through education will not be met. This is a major development challenge. My comments so far have focused on the benefits education has for overcoming the multiple effects of poverty and inequality and on ways to improve access to participation in and the quality and relevance of education. But there's another critical dimension of education I want to touch on, and it is referred to in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that is the role of education in promoting peace, tolerance, understanding, and friendship, in the words of the Declaration. Education has the power to build positive attitudes and behaviours which bring peoples together. Of course, the converse is also true. A curriculum which is imbued with bias, prejudice, and misrepresentation of the other will exacerbate tensions and reinforce divisions. So, conflict-sensitive approaches to education can promote coexistence, acceptance that there are dual narratives of history, gender equity, problem-solving, dispute resolution skills, affording education a key role in a society's path to peace. Education has not really been a priority in peace-building discussions to date, I regret to say. But I do believe that development considerations, including education, just have to become part of the mainstream discourse around peace and security. My own organisation is part of a working group on education and fragility of an interagency network for education and emergency. And this work is focusing on crisis-sensitive education where there is fragility and conflict. And it's hoped that the work will lead to developing guidelines and tools for educators in such settings and open up opportunities to leverage the powerful transformative capacity of education in the service of peace. It's also important to note that children in strife-torn countries often face especially large obstacles in going to school. The level of insecurity may prevent them leaving home at all, and local educational infrastructure may be destroyed. Even worse, children themselves in some conflicts are coerced into becoming combatants. A UNICEF report on Sierra Leone comments on how the education system there was devastated during the country's civil war. Up to 70% of school-aged children through that war had either very limited or no access to education at all. And the World Bank has estimated that only 13%, 1-3% of Sierra Leone's schools were usable by 2001. 
Children like these become a lost generation unless huge efforts are made to give them a second chance to be educated. Once that virtuous cycle which education can stimulate is broken and is replaced by a vicious cycle, it does become harder to move from conflict to peace building and to sustained human development. So, to conclude, my thesis is that education has an indispensable role to play in driving equitable and sustainable development. As the 2015 date for the MDG targets looms near, it is fair to say that as a whole, people around the world are healthier, wealthier, and better educated than ever before, on average. Since 1990, that baseline year against which we're measuring progress, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of income poverty. The global targets of halving the proportion of people living in extreme poverty and without sustainable access to safe drinking water have been met. There are 40% fewer deaths from tuberculosis and 30% fewer deaths from malaria than there were in 1990. But it must be recognised that aggregate figures, averages of achievement, do disguise those inconvenient truths. That ending extreme poverty and hunger is an unfinished agenda. Striking inequalities persist across and within countries and our ecosystems are under considerable stress. Part of doing whatever it takes to lift human development so that every person on this earth can fulfill their potential and live in dignity is providing access to education. Its power to transform lives has ripple effects over every area of development, making investment in education one of the very most effective investments a society can ever make. In our currently fiscally constrained world, struggling to recover from the many crises which beset it, it is more important than ever to focus on development of investments which have the most transformational and catalytic effects. That, together with those ringing words of the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights, that, quote, everyone has the right to education, must surely put education at the very top of development agendas. Thank you. Um, a lot of times also the uh, families in power sent their children to England to be educated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just wondering if that kind of uh, going back to your community is still evident today where individuals who were able to uh, survive and, and become educated in these various countries in Africa and the Middle East, do they go back? They come to the United States, they go to England for education. Um, is there a tendency to go back and help in their country? I, I think, in all honesty, it's a pretty mixed picture. I've just been in Haiti for around 72 hours in very recent days and uh, was looking there at the proportion of people who finish secondary school, let alone have further education from that, who go on to, to migrate permanently. It's a very, very high proportion. Uh, so that's why I think when, when countries are planning and capacity to, to plan and, and then execute a plan is, is often one of the huge capacity gaps in, in many of the countries in which we work. It is important to be linking the opportunity you open up through education to the course that your economy and society is going to, to take. Otherwise, you may educate people for no future at all in the land of their birth. Hence, then there's a push factor uh, out, uh, as well as the pull factor, of course, of the, the higher salaries and living standards of developing countries, which uh, attracts uh, people uh, away in quite significant numbers. Uh, thank you for wonderful speech. Um, like 
UNDP and World Bank and UNESCO has worked for increasing and uh, providing more opportunity for the primary education and secondary education for achieving the Millennium Development Goals. But I personally think that in the long term, higher education is also very important for improving the economic uh, system in terms of the sustainability. So what is your take on about the higher education law uh, from the long term? Well, of course, higher education is, is vital because if we're looking at capacity gaps in countries, countries need to staff their, their civil service, uh, their economy, let alone their, their, their teaching profession, their, their health profession, the whole range of professions, they, they, they need to educate uh, those people. Uh, but, you know, where I think it, it really is important to place emphasis is also on getting every child on the first rung on the ladder because you're never going to get to, to be a, you know, have a master's degree in education if you couldn't get to school in, in the first place. And that's um, you know, still the plight of a lot of children. But I, I think what has been very positive about the Millennium Development Goals and setting an absolute target with a date like 2015 to get every child into school is it has really focused countries' minds on the critical importance of achieving this. And while not everybody is going to achieve it, nonetheless the focus has accelerated uh, the, the progress. I think of a you know, at least developed country like Burkina Faso that I was privileged to visit a couple of, of years ago. The, the adult literacy rate there is, is under 30% around 28% from memory. Now, they have managed by 2010 to get 66% of children into school. Now, it's not 100%, but in a country where literacy rates are 28%, it's a triumph. So we just have to keep you know, really supporting, encouraging countries uh, to get there and hope that over time, they can put the whole education pyramid uh, in place so that the the children can finish primary school, can all go on to secondary school, and then follow the pathways which, which go from that, which may be into further academic study, maybe into uh, vocational and skills study and training. But you have to have the first step on the ladder to even think about that. The, the talk about educational reform in the Middle East has been going on for a long time. What we've heard a little less about is the ways that um, the schooling system re reflects the authoritarian regimes um, that they've operated under for a very long time. The same kind of authoritative pedagogies, um, you know, um, this kind of hierarchical. So it, it's more about the quality. I guess we're going back to the quality or the, the form of education. And I, I wished if you could comment a little bit about that and the ways that you might see the UNDP's work with some of the p partner agencies, perhaps UNICEF and others, starting to address supporting some of these kinds of reforms that are really necessary mm -hmm. in order to sustain the kind of development of democratic mm -hmm. societies that will, will come in later, yeah. the, the transition per se. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're making very, very important points and one hopes that societies in transition will make it a high priority to revisit the curriculum and what's actually taught uh, and and of course put a priority on quality as as well and and it's not just about you know education for a skill for the economy it's about education for life it's about education for a different kind of society it's about education for for citizen engagement ability to participate be part of the the d debate about the future of your your country and so, yes, uh, fundamentally, if, if societies are going to change, the education system has to change to equip uh, people to be part of that different society of, of the future. In answer to an earlier question, <clears throat> you made the point that if we didn't do ABC, then we'd just be educating them for no future at all. And my question relates to that because, yes, education is very important, but when you look at the economic structure, 
if the economic structure is not providing opportunities. This is why a lot of young people are emigrating from countries when they have the education. Then we hear about brain drain. I don't know that UNDP can address those issues, but if the economic structure continues to be the same and the social belief systems about class continue to be the same, uh, we, there, is a continuing prob there are continuing problems that are not being addressed in terms of helping masses of poor people to gain more equality in society. So I wish you ask that you would address that question mm. to the extent that you can. Thank you. No, you're, you're absolutely right that from the point of view of the individual, if the skills and potential they have can't be satisfied at home, they will look for other options. Uh, and sometimes the search for those options becomes rather, rather desperate as we see people in small craft trying to make it across uh, difficult waters, say, to this country or out of uh, Western North Africa uh, into Europe, you know, anything to try and you know, gain access to you know, being able to earn money, have a better life, send money back home. There's huge push factors where the societies don't create uh, opportunity. And, and that's why, again, you know, we, we can't divorce education from these, these broader factors of you know, our economies being designed to be, to be inclusive and to really you know, meet, meet people's basic needs for, for income and, and survival. And clearly, a great many don't. We don't have the capacity to do it for, for, for many people, which uh, then propels them often towards uh, rather, rather desperate solutions. Or where there's, where there's orderly migration, because people have skills and education, that, that of course is a, a brain drain away from the, uh, the country which is exporting its people. In a variety of your comments, uh, in response to questions and in your earlier discussion, you seem to be framing the economy as if it's a national rather than a global phenomena. Um, some have argued that anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of trade is actually within multinational corporations, not between. I wonder if you could speak to the role that you would hope multinational corporations would be playing to both contribute to economic development, but also to encouraging um, education uh, for more children. Well, you shouldn't ask a New Zealander to talk about trade because it can lead to a rather, <laughs> rather long answer. So I'll control myself and say that Yes, uh, poor countries actually face great discrimination in the world trading system. The, the problem is the, the trade talks that might have a chance of dealing with that are absolutely paralysed. Uh, so to come then to the, 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 the practical question you've asked, which is what could multinational corporations do, the answer is a lot. And where we come in is uh, endeavouring to work with companies on how to support the micro, small, medium-sized producers in developing countries into their value chains. And uh, working with companies on their business model uh, so that they can have a win-win. They still need to be profitable. Business must be profitable to, to survive. But in the course of being profitable, uh, they can create opportunities for others. And uh, you just, I guess, could take you know, simple examples uh, like the tourism industry. So many developing countries one goes to with uh, tourism resorts, uh, the local people get to supply hardly as much as a lettuce leaf to the plate. And yet, what are people doing around about? They're growing things. But the support is needed to, to grow in quantity and quality uh, to the specifications of, say, a tourism hotel. So there's many, many examples of, of how working uh, with uh, the companies you can create entry points into the, the value chains, and we're involved in, in rather a lot of that. You, you talked about the quantitative and qualitative changes that are taking place in schooling, mm. and I was interested, however, though, you go back a while to what Paolo Freire said about 40-odd like, years ago. He was saying that the tools of the oppressors are not those that are going to bring about the change for the oppressed groups. I'm paraphrasing a bit. 
yet we are continually promoting schools and schooling that was a model developed in the 19th century for the factory movement. We are now trying to develop societies that are based upon, that are knowledge societies, that you yourself have been very significant, had a significant role in leading this development. In your experience, I'm really interested, have you come across any examples from around the world where there are alternative models that are growing out of the less powerful groups, if you like, in society that might actually be ways of educating and, and meeting these mass millennial goals that are absolutely vital, but that might not involve in repeating the industrial type model of schools and schooling? Um, it's a really interesting question and might take me a, a little beyond the, the expertise I have and the things that I see in my current position, but I'd, I'd venture to suggest that for the most part we're probably still seeing a rather traditional model of a school and children in a school and uh, trying to figure out how to pay to put the teachers and the classroom package uh, uh, t together. But having said that, I want to acknowledge that people may have examples of, uh, of different approaches uh, you know, coming from the, you know, the kind of philosophy uh, uh, that you referred, referred back to. But I, I don't have uh, insights uh, into that myself. Um, I can just answer the last speaker briefly to say that in Silicon Valley, the masters of the universe behind the education reform movement who want to see everybody on computer screens, <laughs> even testing on computer screens, send their children to Waldorf schools, mm -hmm. which are no screens at all, all hands-on learning. Mm -hmm. So that tells us that that's really what children need, if, if that's where they're sending their children. Mm -hmm. And in my question, well, for kindergartners on screens, it's scary. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to build on the previous questioner's mm -hmm. thought a train of thought to say that a few weeks ago I was hearing a Columbia professor talk about uh, there was a discussion about what happened to the population bomb theory back in the late 60s and that in India as various organizations were trying to get them to use birth control one of the leaders of, of the country there came out and said no that's not what we need you know that when countries develop, the population goes down. So we need to develop our way out of this population explosion. And even as we all know that, I'm wondering how you see the neoliberal mindset that we now have, I know you don't want to talk about trade, but that says we need labor arbitrage, we need to let go of mid-career engineers and bring in lower paid engineers from other countries. We have something, and we have a whole mindset now that is dumbing down the American curriculum, even as people are asking, how can we educate the rest of the world? Yes, I, I haven't heard uh, anyone remind us of that phrase, the population bomb, for a long time, because uh, in, the, in the circles I move in, uh, people are talking about the demographic dividend of the largest youth population the world's uh, ever known. And I guess uh, you know, the, the future of our world in the next few years is going to be uh, about what opportunities we create for those young people. Are we going to thwart potential aspiration by a denial of, of, of basic rights and opportunities and dignity? Or are we going to do something uh, extremely positive to include more of the world's youth uh, on the ladder of, of opportunity, if you like, and being involved in, in this decision making which impacts on them. So I think this, this is a, a huge, huge issue. Uh, UN Secretary General is extremely exercised by this and, and intends to make a, a high level uh, appointment at Under Secretary General level on youth and, and advocacy for youth uh, soon. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's very positive and obviously in our, in our program we will do whatever we can uh, to support that. But your second point is, 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 is absolutely correct, that birth rates do fall uh, as uh, human development advances. Uh, and I made the reference in the speech to uh, education for girls. The longer girls are in school, the longer it is that the age of marriage will 
be likely to be delayed. The, the, the birth of the first child uh, will, will come at a, at a, later, a later age. You know, it, it, is, it is positive for, for the women, for their health, for them developing their potential. It will also have the effect of you know, stabilizing, starting to reduce uh, population uh, rates. Um, as for the, the last point, um, well, I, I'm, I'm not one who thinks that the answer to countries' economic problems is in you know, cutting, cutting wage rates and, and, uh, and destroying uh, careers, at, et cetera. And, uh, and I do, I've, I've always taken as a, you know, a model for my own uh, thinking about where I'd like my own country to go, uh, looking at the, the high income, high wage, high value societies of Scandinavia who managed to strike uh, you know, a reasonably happy balance uh, with, uh, with strong economies and, and strong and cohesive uh, societies. And that, that's you know, personally the, the kind of direction I like to see. What we see in education often is that there's a shift away from kind of away from indigenous cultures and indigenous knowledge towards, in a lot of places, the colonial languages and away from local knowledge. And I know that in New Zealand, and I wanted to ask as prime minister, um, how you sought to incorporate more indigenous knowledge into policies and into the educational system. I know you have several people here who have spoken to that in an earlier panel, but from your perspective at UNDP and as the prime minister, how we can maintain a respect for indigenous knowledges in this hyper-global society. In the uh, lecture, I use the term the dual narrative. You know, it's important to acknowledge that not everyone sees the events uh, <laughs> that have occurred in one's country exactly the same way. So it's important to acknowledge there are different perspectives, different narratives about what happened. But that there are also different world views. Now, in my time as Prime Minister, a rather radical thing happened with the uh, education curriculum because we launched the New Zealand education curriculum, uh, which was the first time uh, there'd been a, an amalgamated curriculum, if you like, which brought together the different subject streams. But parallel to that, there was developed uh, a curriculum for uh, the Maori immersion and bilingual schools. And this curriculum was not a translation of the New Zealand curriculum. It was actually developed by educators, uh, Maori educators and people, I guess, who work closely with Maori educators and enabled those different uh, perspectives, different worldviews to be reflected. So those uh, interested in how that could be done might like to look at the two curricula and, uh, and see where they converge and, and, and where they diverge and, and allow, you know, uh, more space for uh, an indigenous minority to assert its worldview. I was uh, particularly interested in the question that came from over here about the migration of people around the world because I do quite a lot of work on feeding the world and we've got to feed another two billion people in the next 38 years. And whichever way you cut or dice that question, that's an extraordinary challenge. And you touched on the momentum of people moving India's got this enormous um, bulge, and I think very positive in terms of youth. China's past the peak now. It'll have fewer workers in the future than it's got today. One child family, the number of workers now, that's just catching up. The most advanced area of that probably is uh, Japan and Russia. Both countries are substantially dying out in terms of their age structure. And in your work at the UNDP, I was wondering whether you look at what is the likely, I say inevitability, of more people moving around the world because, frankly, they don't have the opportunities at home and the developed world will need these workers in a variety of ways and needs them as taxpayers too, I might add, to pay the pensions for the retired. Those of you who are looking a little older around here, just remember that. Uh, but it seems to me there is a huge space here that the world is work, walking around the outside of because it's too nervous to get into it. And you only need a few refugees to come close to country A, B or C that's wealthy and sort of the barriers go up and they say, this is terrible, we're going to be overtaken by whatever particular ethnic group it is we're going to be overtaken by today. 
yet it seems to me we need to have at supernatural level, like the UN, to start to articulate the inevitability and the necessity, we do it the other way around, the necessity that it's going to be inevitable anyhow, that people will have to move around the world and uh, both the developing world will benefit from the opportunities that provides for their young people, their qualified people, and even those not so qualified. And the developed world will desperately need those workers. So just wondering if anything's going on there. Helen, thanks. You know, migration is such a sensitive issue with the member states that the UN uh, agencies, funds and programs have largely been kept at bay <laughs> from the, um, the member states' gatherings in, in a way that is most unusual. Uh, now, uh, our contribution to the debate about migration uh, was the 2009 Human Development Report, which was on precisely the topic of migration. And it asserted that migration, properly organised, has the ability to be of huge benefit to both the source country and to the receiving country. Uh, but for there to be those benefits, and we call them human development benefits, you have to provide ways for people to move that don't put them in degrading, demeaning, dangerous and deadly circumstances, like being, being trafficked or you know, being robbed blind and put on the small boat and, and cast on, on the high seas. I mean, whose interest is, is this in? So we need a much more rational conversation around the world about exactly the points that you raised, because the demographics in many of the developed countries mean that they, they cannot, without migration, uh, actually care for their old, their young, uh, and, and perform a lot of the tasks right through the societies, and, and not just the unskilled service jobs, but right up, right up through, through the line. I mean, it, it may well be that a time will come when developed countries start paying people to come again. And, and, and I don't say that in, in jest. My, my own country used to pay people to come, you know, the two pound passage from the United Kingdom, for example, after the war and similar schemes with, uh, with uh, the Netherlands. But what, what I've noticed uh, over my years of public life in New Zealand is that here were we, a, a little developed country, and you know, tended to assume that the world wanted to come and live there. So your attitude is almost, you know, this must be control. Now, actually, what we started to see as China and India, for example, took off, was that when people migrated, they came with a very specific objective, which might have been to get education and or work experience, but they were going back. It's going to be very hard for developed countries to hold on to the skilled professionals from developing countries that are really on the move. And then what are the developed countries with their declining demographics going to do? So uh, I just think we, we need a lot more open and considered uh, discussion about uh, these things. Uh, the migration, of course, is not only across uh, national borders. There's huge migration going on within countries. A uh, number of the countries I go to uh, the, the countryside is under terrific stress. Take the Sahel, the rains don't come so many years now, people can't feed themselves, there's, there's a push out to the city. And uh, the head of UN Habitat makes the point that the era of urbanisation we're now seeing in developing countries is the first time that urbanisation has not been accompanied by industrialisation. In other words, people are coming into the cities and there hasn't been a lot of talk about where are the jobs going to be in the city. So you're swelling the informal settlements and the informal uh, economy. And uh, often, as in the example I gave of Delhi, it's pretty tough for children in these swelling settlements and, and cities uh, to get access to education. So it's the international movement across borders and the internal movement uh, that uh, needs a lot more, more thinking about how how are we going to create uh, opportunity and improve human development for the world population? Um, we have two prime ministers in the house. Um, could you describe a typical day of a prime minister and how much control do you have over the agenda of your day versus the responsiveness that's necessary to conditions? <laughs> oh, I could, um, 
I could give you an example of a typical day as the Prime Minister, and it might be too different from the one Jim Bolger had. And it would start on uh, a Monday morning. Uh, Jim Bolger lived in the in the, the Waikato region, a rural region, uh, probably 300 miles from Wellington, and I lived in Auckland, 400 miles from Wellington. So first thing you did was the alarm went off at five in the morning. Often went up off at five in the morning uh, after you'd had about four hours sleep because you'd been on the phone to your colleagues about their cabinet papers, which we're going to discuss later in the morning. And so you would, you would uh, sort of wake yourself up uh, with heavy coffees, you would conduct various radio interviews from your home before you got in the car, you'd go to the TV studios before you went to the airport, you'd get the plane to Wellington, you'd bring in your advisors uh, to talk about what was on the cabinet agenda, you'd bring in your colleagues and talk informally to them, you'd go to the cabinet room, that would go through till one o'clock, you'd grab some lunch and start reading about all the issues that might be thrown at you at your press conference. You'd wander down to that about three o'clock in the afternoon and entertain questions from the sublime to the ridiculous. And uh, about, about then, you would either um, uh, prepare for a speech you were giving in Wellington that evening or get on a plane and fly off somewhere else to give one uh, uh, in some other centre. I mean, that is a very, very typical day as a Prime Minister, and that goes uh, for f the five working days of the week. Don't think it stops at the weekend. Because if you're a constituency M MP, you've, you've uh, got people demanding to see you, bowling clubs to be opened for the season, football trophies to be given out, uh, visiting delegations from offshore that insist on coming to your town on a Saturday and Sunday, uh, some major event in a provincial town three hours flight away. You know, life went on. It was a great relief when you got to the Christmas holidays and people wanted to shut the door on politicians. So, um, but, I mean, how much control did you have on this? Well, firstly, you could say it's all self-inflicted. I mean, we're all volunteers for these jobs and, you know, fight, fight almost to the death to, to get them. And, and secondly, you know, you, ca you can control, you know, how much you take on and how much you're involved. But uh, there, is a, there is a happy medium. If you do too little, you'll never get to the top and stay there. If you do too much, you'll kill yourself trying to do it. So that's, that's the answer in a nutshell. <laughs>